uh, welcome uh, to our, our class. Our time together is starting to come uh, uh, to, towards uh, the end as you graduate in uh, December. And uh, I think it's a good time to stop and sort of reflect upon what we've been doing for the past six months in this uh, scholars seminar. Uh, the theme of the seminar has been the local dynamics of war. And the reason that we've created this seminar, we've worked together for the past six months, is because our top uh, military professionals and top scholars are saying that in order to succeed with our troops, our money, our words, and our relationships by interve intervening in the operational environment, we have to know, know the dynamics of what's going on. We have to know the stakeholders, the organizations, the rules, the various uh, interplays that are going on in the environment. I think this, this uh, emphasis is also echoed by our top leaders today, General Dempsey, and General Flynn, and General McChrystal, now retired, General Rodriguez, who's been going to AFRICOM, his setting up, General Rodriguez is setting up of the Information Dominance Center in Afghanistan was an acknowledgement that we need to pay attention to the local dynamics on the ground. Now, what I want to do today is kind of sum up by sharpening the importance of what we've done for the past six months. We've been devoted to gathering an ethos, gathering a skill set, and developing a framework that helps us take different cuts of what's going on in the operational environment to, to address this problem that our top military professionals and top scholars have, have acknowledged. The way we've done that is by using the, the framework that you know so well right now, the modified IED framework. We've worked through this in pieces and we put it back together and we put it in use. I want to do that again today, but for a specific purpose. Army doctrine, I'm going to argue, has a tension within it. And I'm going to present what that tension is. And the tension is between Pemessi PT analysis and systems analysis. Army doctrine tells us to do both. Now what we're going to do is an experiment today. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to split the room. Part of the class will do Pemessi PT analysis on a real world scenario. The other, uh, the other part of the room will do a systems analysis in accordance with the framework that you've learned. And we're going to see if we can uh, come to any conclusions about whether one is superior to the other and whether there is really a tension in doctrine or there's a, there's a problem with doctrine that we need to address. Let me present to you uh, uh, the, the tension I'm talking about. ADRP 5.0. Here's one, one passage from it. This is from uh, chapter 1, uh, paragraph 1-32. Commanders and staffs use the operational emission variables. Use the operation, operational emission variables to help build their situational understanding. They analyze and describe an operational environment in terms of eight interrelated operational variables. This is from SEPT, right? Political, military, economic, social, information, infrastructure, physical environment, and time. You know these. Upon receipt of a mission, commanders filter, filter information categorized by the operational variables into relevant information with respect to the mission. So do you see, see the image here? Pemessi PT is a framework. I'm going to use that framework as a filter through which to understand the operational environment. So the first thing I do as a commander, as a staff officer, as a military intelligence officer, as a civil affairs officer, as a SOF officer, as an XO and S3, the first thing I do is I pick up the Messi PT framework and everything I perceive goes through that framework. That's one view, chapter one. Okay. Same document. This is uh, uh, chapter two, paragraph 2-35 and 2-36. The commander and staff develop a contextual understanding of the situation by framing the current conditions of an operational environment. A diagram illustrating relevant actors, relationships, and they, and, uh, actors and relationships enables understanding and visualizing the operational environment. Often, relationships among actors have many facets, and these relationships differ depending on the scale of interaction and temporal aspects, history, duration, type, and frequency. Clarifying the relationships among actors requires intense effort. 
since these relationships must be examined from multiple perspectives. That you were talking about, right? I perceive a tension here, and I want to work through it with you uh, during, this, uh, during this session. On the one hand, we're told to use PEM SCPT framework. Everything we see goes through it. On the other hand, we're told to use something like a systems analysis where we have nodes and links and showing the relationships between the two. Um, I've been to several cl classrooms when they're teaching C400, uh, which is when we study operational art, right? And then C500 when the uh, tactics department uh, teaches uh, uh, tactics and how we go about planning there. Everybody by now appreciates that, at least rhetorically, we need to understand the operational environment, the complexity of it, like uh, uh, General Jerry uh, talked about. The way this is done in practice, in the four floors of Lewis and Clark, I would argue in about 75%, if not more, is that the instructor or the staff lead, the student staff lead, will say, okay, John and Jim, you go and you analyze, uh, or you look at all the yeah. political variables. Yeah. Stacy and Mike, you go look at all the military variables. Okay. Joan and Jean, you go look at all the economic variables. And you do it for the entire PEM SCPT framework. And what you see then is a list of things that are put on each one. And the effect of this and this is something that Christie's pointed out in, in, her, in her paper, is that you create silos where you definitely do not see the linkages between each of these things. But I, I think the other thing you end up doing yourself there is that uh, assuming you split it up that way, you end up with things that don't, that either fit in multiple categories or don't quite fit cleanly in any category and you're left there fig trying to figure out where the hell do I put this to make it so that it fits into my neat little framework. Um, and I think you probably will end up kind of squishing it one way or the other because mentally that's what you're doing with your data. And you, without really intending to, you've done that. And so now when you go and describe what you've done to somebody else, whether you meant to or not, you, you get rid of some of that ambiguity in presenting it in a framework that, that actually was valuable ambiguity. So. so I think you're right on. What, one of the problems is the silo effect, right? Another problem, as you mentioned, is the uh, 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 lack of appreciation for ambiguity. We can't simplify just for the sake of simplification. We, we have to appreciate the complexity of the amb ambiguity, right? So we silo the different the variables. There's a lack of appreciation for ambiguity. And then the third one I would men, uh, mention is that there is no criteria, a criterion for relevance. Okay, a certain polity has a legislature of 350 people. Well, that's a political fact that you might put under here. But does it matter to the operational environment in terms of our employment of troops, money, words, and relationships. Doesn't matter. What we're going to do is, uh, uh, Tavina and Christy are going, uh, all of us are going to listen to a, to a four minute uh, NPR clip. Tavina and Christy are going to apply uh, the modified IED framework, not necessarily to do analysis, but to listen carefully and identify the interactions as they arise, to identify who the stakeholders are, to identify some of the narratives that are at play for the proximate context and the distal context to identify some of the elements, some of the open systems that are, that are affecting the setup of the proximate context and then likewise proximate of the, of the patterns of interaction. Okay? What we'll do is we'll do a PEM SCPT analysis, part of the room, modified IED framework in another part of the room, and then we'll, I'll give you some time to clean up uh, after you listen, and then Danny will kind of make some observations and we'll have a discussion as a group about, about what we came up with. Okay? Kasha, Tony, are you set? Is yes, everybody good to go? Roman Cart? And uh, Tavina Christie, are you good to go? Cool. All right. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Melissa Bach. And I'm Rob Siegel. Syrian Air Force jets launched a failed strike today 
Their target, a rebel military headquarters in the northern part of the country. But it's the rebels who've been on the offensive lately, seizing four strategic military bases in just the past week. And today, they claim to have captured a hydroelectric dam on the Euphrates River that supplies electricity to much of the area. NPR's Deborah Amos has been following the rebels' offensive, and she joins us now from the city of Gaziantep in Turkey, which is close to the Syrian border. And uh, Deb, what's going on there? Have the rebels gotten better, stronger, smarter, or are the government forces getting weaker, or both? It is both. As many military analysts say, President Bashar al-Assad's military offensive capability is diminished, and now the defensive capability is diminished too. For the rebels, they're just getting more experienced, and you can see that in the past week, capturing four bases. Then on Sunday, a helicopter base less than 15 miles from the heart of the capital. Now, I gather you spoke today uh, with the head of the rebel military council of Aleppo, a uh, northern city where the rebels have been battling government troops uh, for months. How does he see these recent advances? I crossed into northern Syria, and I interviewed Obey Jabber Ogaidi at his headquarters, and he laughed when I suggested that the regime and the rebels were in a stalemate. He said, for the rebels of Aleppo, the recent capture of Base 46, and it's west of the city, was a major breakthrough. It's been under siege for months. It's where the regime forces launch daily artillery strikes on Aleppo. And so, for Ogedi, the capture of Base 46 showed the experience of the rebels. I don't talk to any military analyst who calls this a stalemate anymore. I talked to one today who said the time may come when the Syrian military can no longer sustain the price in some of these cities, Aleppo in the north, Deir Ezzor in the east, that they may not be capable of a coherent pullback. Now for the rebels, what they're talking about is going on to Damascus. They say the plans are set, and what we may see is Damascus, the capital of Syria, is the next major battleground. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Robert. That's uh, NPR's Deborah Amos reporting from the city of Gaziantep in Turkey, which is near the border with Syria. Now take a few minutes to uh, clean up your analysis. Syrian base, it's now in rebel hands. Um, rising protections, uh, I think that's a social factor that uh, is gonna gain momentum. Um, I mean, the more people that defect, the easier it is for more people to defect. You know, it's a, it's a social. How much time do you think you're spending on actually trying to categorize things as opposed to, like, understand? Do you, do you see attention? Oh, definitely, sir. I mean, and we, I, I think out of fear of an action plan, we both captured something. Right. And probably none of them are a good fix um, because they should be overlapping the whole, uh, several. But it, it, but you're right, we're not understanding, we're trying yeah, to make sure that we're God provided in the right yeah. spot. Yeah. But I would also say it's better than nothing. I mean, it's, the, no, absolutely. The, absolutely. The, the, the information. Otherwise, we're strictly looking at ourselves you know, in terms yeah. of lines of effort, lines of operation, conditions, and right. state, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, keep it, keep it going. Yeah. 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 So your, your approach here was just simply to list all the uh, elements that you heard and then put a little uh, parentheses next to it. What category that fall Capture everything and then and then do my quick quick analysis. Yeah. 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 Gain the momentum that they need in order to continue so yeah. to push the all cut regime um, down enough to I guess focus on controlling Syria. Do you see how this might be like a feedback loop? For the defectors here, a narrative saying that everybody agrees that the rebels are on the up, uh, on, uh, on the up, and the uh, soldiers are going So, so they defect which further strengthens the narrative, mm -hmm. which then increases more defectors, and that's a feedback loop. Moreover, the way you describe this, the defectors are rational actors. Which side's winning? I want to survive. Right. And the rebels. They make it easier. So this, the momentum gained here by this, allows them to feel comfortable enough to leave, um, or flipping to switch alliances, or to feel comfortable enough that I can leave oppressive behavior and join uh, a side that I'm good with. One list for my livelihood and protection would be the greater employment. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So these are the participants, and then they're involved in interactions. Have you identified what those are? Well, there's the defections. Okay. So to defections themselves are interactions. And I would say that clearly the rebel strength increases because of that. And also the rebels interacting with the military centers, the bases. So we have. 
well still bring to the army this amount of And this is rational actor, right? It's, it's you're really not listening to, to culture, or religious. Or, or, uh, uh, well, but there are some advocates. I mean, they clearly believe that they have got the rebels believe they have got support, which, which <laughs> the actors are likely to, to that's likely to appeal to them as well in terms of you know if I join them and yeah. God's rebel towards them, yeah. Yeah. Sure. then then God is for me too. So that yeah. there's some of that sort of thing. It's certainly, I mean, it can be pretty so religious. Like the well, you know, it's hard to say it's not rational because from your perspective, you're going to be rational action. It's something that what you include in your cost benefit is different. You know, if you believe in hell, then you're going to weigh your cost and benefit differently. When you don't, it's still rational based on your cost benefit. This is not part of the phrase. Another person would say it was irrational action. So it's kind of something I have to be rational action. Um, one thing Colonel Perez noted uh, when he came over and talked to, to um, Kasha and uh, Tony earlier was how much time did you spend just organizing and trying to force the information into the framework versus using the information to promote understanding? And I think that uh, that was clearly the case with this group having taken notes separately from their effort to organize, which I understand it's, um, I think the model somewhere requires that or somewhat compels that. Um, the contrast here was having a framework already for um, the fact that there is a distal context that consists of these kinds of elements, approximate context, consists of actors and these kind of interactions. I think it made it um, easier to do some of the analysis or recognize the relevance of some of th these issues as they came. Plus not being forced to um, categorize things as either political or economic, uh, I think left a little bit more freedom here. Um, now one other observation is when I just eavesdropped on the groups, uh, I, could, I didn't hear much from, from Christy and Tavina because they didn't have partners to interact with. So the only insight I had is when Tavina is briefing Colonel Perez on what she's doing up here, it was all discussion of the implications of what we had heard, versus these groups back here, it was just regurgitation of what we had heard. And I think the framework invites, um, one of the things I think it does is shows where some of the gaps in information are. Um, you can say that a little bit with Pemissi PT, like I have nothing in my information column, so there must be some gaps in what I know about the information environment. But I don't think that you're always going to have the same level of detail in each column. And I think that framework compels you to try to say, oops, I'm unbalanced, let me throw something in political. Whereas this framework, I think, instead shows genuine gaps. Um, where, what are some things I don't know? And where can I draw some inferences from the things that I do know that start to answer those questions? So I think this, this framework offers some very relevant questions here. Now, the bottom line, my argument is, that the unit of analysis that we should focus on is not, as chapter one of the ADRP said, the PMS CPT framework. The number one thing we do in chronological order is focus on the interactions that are going on. What struck me about this as you were commenting here is that these are only relevant insofar as they affect an interaction. And because this one never gets to the point of talking about their impact on interactions, or you can carry it that far, it's just not um, designed for that specifically, you are, there after, you are therefore briefing um, operational variables which you don't really know if, whether, how they affect interactions. Um, this one, because it's focused on interactions, they, it comes out automatically. And design is found both in joint doctrine, operational design, and in army doctrine with the army design methodology. One of the critiques is that it takes too much time. But we know that the first question of design, whether we're talking joint or army, is what's going on in the environment? which one gets you into a more penetrating uh, analysis more so from SEPT or systems analysis. And I would argue that it's the latter that gives you a quicker uh, bite into the complexity of the environment. And given the scarcity of time when we're operating, I think it's worth considering the possibility that maybe this, this experiment, experiment wasn't as stacked as it appears to be, uh, and to do a real one, right? Uh, okay, any uh, uh, comments to conclude? All right, thank you very much, good session.